<laughs> What's good to see is a lot of enthusiasm about, enthusiasm about the subject, uh, that people want to continue speaking about it uh, everywhere here in the room. Well, anyway, my name is Walter Douglas, and I'll be the moderator for this, uh, for this next hour. And we have a, a very distinguished panel here, and really delighted that we can continue the discussion about a uh, U.S.-Egypt uh, free trade agreement uh, with our panel. And uh, perhaps hear some other views and some, um, some, other, uh, uh, some depth that um, could add and complement to what we just heard earlier. Um, at any rate, let me just give you a quick introduction here before we jump in. Uh, Phil English uh, was a congressman in, um, uh, from Pennsylvania uh, and is now at um, uh, Arndt Fox and uh, the, the firm here in, in Washington. But one thing that's especially noteworthy about him is he was on the Ways and Means Committee and was very involved with uh, trade agreements. And so he brings a lot of expertise about what's been going on in the Hill and is very current with that. Uh, Hisham Fame is from, uh, uh, is, we're lucky to have him here in from Cairo. He's the head of the executive director at the AmCham in Cairo. And really, as, as you look at his resume, has been devoted at the, he's at the spear point, really, of American business interests in Cairo and uh, in Egypt and, uh, and doing everything he can to, to increase them and to, to make sure it's a, a fantastic relationship. Uh, I would also note he's um, uh, uh, been in Cairo for quite a while. He studied at the American University in Cairo, uh, which is truly one of the most uh, distinguished universities in the Middle East and one of the most beautiful as well. Uh, and then we have Meredith Broadbent, who's here with CSIS. You heard her uh, at, at the last session. But at any rate, um, she is the one who actually then authored and directed the report, uh, which she'll have a chance to speak to you uh, about. Uh, so first, I'd like to start with um, uh, Phil English, and I also would like to also compliment him. Uh, he, he made a very good choice where to go to university. He went to the University of Pennsylvania, as I did, and uh, uh, it was a, a perfect choice. So perhaps, um, uh, Mr. English, you'd like to start off giving us a little overview of uh, Thanks, where Walter, we are. Thanks, Walter, and I appreciate the introduction, and I'm sure you made more of a splash at Penn than I did. Uh, <laughs> I, want to, uh, I want to say it is a privilege to be here. I was grateful when, when Meredith contacted me because this is – a topic of a great of great interest to me over time, but also right now our firm uh, has has very much focused on Egypt as one of the areas where there's going to be a remarkable opportunity. Uh, I uh, have to tell you, uh, I was uh, for uh, an Egyptian FTA before it was cool. I remember uh, talking to Charlene Barshevsky about this back in the late 1990s. And at that point, uh, there was a feeling they were not yet ready to proceed with reforms that would make an FTA work. Uh, so the, uh, the negotiation never really took off. Uh, in the middle of the last decade, uh, I was part of a delegation that went over to Egypt at a time when we were talking again about doing an FTA. Uh, and at that point, uh, there, w there was a real sense of uh, that reform was in the air and there was real movement. Uh, that did not uh, lead anywhere. I feel sometimes as an advocate of, uh, of uh, close integration uh, with, with Egypt's economy, kind of like the lost army of King Cambyses. Uh, some of you may remember the story. Um, Cambyses uh, overran Egypt, uh, uh, made it a province of Persia, and uh, sent, uh, well, basically heard there was out in the western desert somewhere uh, a, uh, an oasis called Siwa, where uh, the uh, oracle of Amun was. So he was determined to control that oasis, and he sent an army out into the western desert, and he said, find it. And uh, they um, uh, marched out, and uh, a couple of days later, some folks came back and said, uh, well, there, we haven't found it yet, and it's really hot, and we're in armor. And um, uh, the Cambyses said, keep looking. And uh, about uh, a few days later, uh, another delegation came back and said, you know, there's no water out here. And um, Cambyses said, keep looking. And they marched out, and they disappeared. And uh, by the way, modern archaeologists are planning to use uh, metal detection to see if they can find where the army went, but it never found Siwa. And I've long felt that maybe it would take a long time uh, to work our way and find an FTA with Egypt. Uh, right now, I'm optimistic. Why? 
because a number of things have changed. First and foremost, Egypt has gone through in the lead up to the current situation uh, a series of market reforms that I think make us optimistic uh, that we could uh, integrate our economies. Uh, market reforms in banking, market reforms uh, in the tariff arena, market reforms in regulation. Second of all, the Arab Spring uh, has, has, as people noted in the last panel, uh, created an opportunity. I think it has also created an expectation of growth uh, uh, and change within the, the public. Uh, and a free trade agreement with the United States would be an enormous add-on uh, to that. So notwithstanding the fact that the nominal leaders uh, of the, in the le first round of Egyptian elections, uh, were the Muslim Brotherhood, who we don't no normally associate uh, as potential allies. Uh, they nevertheless have distinguished themselves from the Salafists, and uh, they are clearly interested in putting together a coalition in the center, whatever that center may be. Uh, we potentially could fill an enormous need for them. And this is coupled with the fact that Egypt is going through a substantial economic crisis, uh, not only uh, a long-term problem with a skills gap and with corruption, uh, but with a large informal economy and very, very high unemployment. Uh, they need dramatic economic growth to turn that around. And on uh, this side, uh, the United States, I think, has achieved a major breakthrough and a decisive change in trade policy. The passage of the three FTAs shows that there is a new potential coalition in Congress to pass this kind of agreement. Uh, I, would, I would add, um, not only is it a sign of support for free trade, but perhaps more importantly, it's a sign uh, that the traditional opponents of free trade were decimated in the 2010 election. Uh, and into this uh, environment, coupled with the traditional bipartisan support in the Senate uh, for FTAs, there is a great opportunity here. Let's recognize uh, a free trade agreement with Egypt would have an important impact. Its immediate impact would be limited. It would certainly be a strategic asset. Uh, it would also be a modest economic asset, but over time as Egypt changes and as a, a Chairman Dreyer noted, it is the, at 85 million, the largest country in the Arab world and a very important potential platform for us. Uh, we think uh, that this uh, is a partnership that would be potentially useful. We need an FTA to reinforce the reforms in Egypt. We need the FTA to anchor Egypt to the West. We need FTA uh, to promote a demonstration effect, uh, to bring more partners in in the region. And we need an FTA uh, to counter trade diversion uh, as a result of, uh, uh, of trade uh, interactions uh, with the EU. Uh, I think now is a time when this could work. And so it's a very exciting moment. I look forward to your questions. Um, I'll just run through a little bit of our thinking on the paper. You guys all have it, so um, there's things you can ask about if, if you want to drill down too much. Um, but base, basically, this, this paper is focused on how um, the United States might choose Egypt as a future free trade agreement partner. And I'm, I'm going to apologize to Egyptians in advance. In one sense, it's, this is more about how the United States is going to get there. You know, we, um, we can... Uh, kind of look at our situation now. We recognize that we've gotten rid of the pending FTAs, the decks are cleared. Uh, it's now really an appropriate time for the United States to start uh, debating what the new trade strategy is. And I, I think we heard Chairman Brady say that yesterday in his, in his uh, trade agenda, agenda speech. Um, and the, the idea is that we, you know, we need a new trade, trade strategy that takes account of the the new realities and, and a really fast changing global economy that has been transformed since uh, the United States Congress last authorized negotiating objectives for trade agreements. 
In the past, uh, we've had the, for many years, we've had the Foreign Trade Barriers Report, which tends to be USTR's Bible about uh, what we, we want to get, get accomplished with, with each individual country. Um, but I think at this point, we've got to admit that we're not getting what we want from the big guys, from the India, Brazils, and Chinas of the world. Uh, the plan there was to deal with them in the WTO, and that really hasn't been working out. Um, we're, we're basically at an impasse, and I think for the time being, it's important for the United States to start looking at the, the next group of countries that are coming over the horizon, of which we see Egypt as being one. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of different configurations of countries that you might look to, but Egypt fits the bill in, in many, many respects, and, and that's why we thought it was important to, to spend some resources and call it to your attention. Um, the first cut of these arguments, I think, is, is interesting. I mean, we, we sort of see what Egyptians are saying to the U.S. Um, I th the last sort of official meeting that I see registered in the press, at least, is, is Ambassador Taylor, who I think was here, uh, met with, with the trade minister from Egypt, uh, Mr., uh, Minister Issa, in October. And the trade minister there was saying that, that we need a new trade strategy between the United States and Egypt. Minister Issa said that it should focus on achieving joint interests for the two countries, and it should be a program that was felt, a policy that was felt by the Egyptian nation. He said it's time, the time is right for the U.S. to play a role in supporting the Egyptian economy in this transition phase. So I think the... Uh, the thing to keep in mind here is that um, as the new government gets organized in Egypt, it, it is helpful to have the goal out there of an FTA. Um, it's easy to say, United States shouldn't say something, we ought to hang back, be hesitant about what's happening till we see what the character of the new government is. Um, they're not ready to do it. But the fact of the matter, we're not ready to do it either. I mean, if, if the Egyptians announced yesterday that, that they wanted to forge stronger trade, trade ties with us and have a closer relationship, it would be hard to imagine the U.S. following through on that. So we have a lot of work here to do in the United States before we can speak collectively as the United States to Egyptians in a way that can be understood as a signal of support and sort of unified, uh, a unified policy and approach to Egypt. On the commercial side, uh, there's a host of reasons why Egypt makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the issues um, I think that uh, is important to think about is sort of illustrative of, of the general negative progress the U.S. has making, been making on trade agreements uh, overall while other countries are moving ahead. The Europeans have uh, enhanced their trade relationship with the Europeans. In fact, in, they have a U.S., uh, EU, I mean, uh, Egypt. EU association agreement that went into effect many years ago, but it was enhanced in 2007 with some uh, unilateral trade concessions. So now, I mean, on the part of Egypt. So most countries, like the United States, are giving trade preferences to Egypt. We're reducing ba barriers to them. Right now, Egypt is actually accepting Egyptian products at, at duty-free tariffs. And that is having a demonstrable effect on U.S. market share, particularly in the agriculture sector. And the report goes into that. Another reason uh, uh, on, the, on the U.S. competitiveness position with Europe um, is that the Europeans are, are in that market and having a big influence on the stand, standard-setting process in Egypt. This is a complex area, but it has a, has a strong impact on U.S. companies. And when the Europeans are there and able to offer a lot of assistance, they have this agreement that says we ought to harmonize standards uh, and get closer to uh, what the European standards are, uh, that's, that's negative for the United States. Egypt, in fact, may be, for example, not accepting U.S. automobile standards in the future. Historically, they've, they've accepted both the European and the U.S. automobile standards. As time goes on, it sounds like, and the, thing, the statements they've been making are that uh, they'll, they'll be switching to the European standards. So that's, that's a practical negative competitive impact on, on the United States that European involvement in the Egyptian economy is um, promoting in their interest, which is, you know, their prerogative, but, but we ought to be there and be engaged at the same time. The, the third element related to the European competition 
um, is that the trade agreement that Europe has with Egypt gives them a lot of lines of communication into the Egyptian economy. Uh, when you've got a trade agreement in place, you have an office that, that t deals with those trade relations, even through the very difficult political transition taking place in, in, in Egypt during July, August. They were able to have high-level meetings. They were able to have day-to-day -day trade meetings. They were able to conduct business under their trade agreement, which supports their traders. The United States, I think, is, has been hampered. We don't have a mechanism in place. We're, it's politically difficult to have a new type of meeting with the United States, so we don't, we don't talk as, as, as often and as, as deeply as the Europeans in Egypt are able to do. We're a bit on the outside because we don't have this structure in place uh, where the bureaucrats know what their job is, you know, facilitate trade, take care of day-to-day of -day barriers. Um, so I think there are almost intangible benefits there to a trade agreement being in place. If we had had one that went in place earlier, the democratic transition comes, and I, I would argue we would be in a, in a better place than, than we are commercially in Egypt right now. And I think the, the thing that uh, others have really pointed out is the value of the reforms that the Egyptians have undertaken leading up to this point before January 25th. Uh, I think the, the Egyptians deserve a lot of credit for their, their reform of their bureaucracy. Uh, they've uh, uh, done a lot of privatization. And their economies was before, the, before January 25th, and, and to some extent going forward with a lot of foreign investment. And it's led to uh, very strong growth rates, 7% uh, annual growth rate between 2005 and 2008. And even during the, the global downturn in 2008, it fell to only 5%, so three or four times the growth rate that the United States has. And something that the Egyptians need to think about preserving. What are the policies that they need to put in place that will attract investment, make investors secure, and uh, set the structure for a good business environment? And finally, the, on, this, on the, strate the strategic side of negotiating with Egypt, I'm at a loss. Our, the director of our Middle East program is in Egypt right now, John Alterman, and uh, he would be able to give a, a, a good uh, description here. But just strategically overall, Egypt is uh, a very uh, powerful state, essentially the center of gravity for the Arab world. Uh, if Egypt descends in, in, in instability, uh, may, may, maybe other countries in the Arab region will do so. We need to be worried about this, and we need to support sort of the good example from, from Egypt that comes from their professional, professionals that, that really do uh, play a leadership role in, in the, the overall MENA economy um, and have a lot, a, a lot of uh, influence on, on sort of the future development in that region. So in sum, we need to really come up with a, a policy that has uh, defined objectives. If there are, if there are folks in, in the Egyptian government that want to grow and modernize and, interne and integrate into the global economy, um, it is good to have the goal of a free trade agreement out there. Um, we think that Egypt will be a key partner in the future. Um, the, 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 the performance of the economy will drive a lot of, of how the Egyptians approach the future, um, and so we think that it's, the time is right to start thinking about how we build these new avenues of, of interchange and cooperation that, that take place under a free trade agreement. This is, it's an early time, um, but Egyptians are looking to make choices, and a free trade agreement really has, by the nature of its effect on an economy, uh, moves an economy towards market-oriented reforms. And if the United States can see its way clear to have a, a forwardly deployed economic strategy in the region, um, with just even saying the aspirational goal of a free trade agreement, um, it would be, I think, a clearly understood gesture of goodwill and encouragement for Egyptians at, at a pretty uncertain time. So that's sort of the, the thrust of where we were going on the study. Um, it's there for you to read. And we really appreciate these two other speakers coming to, to talk about both how the United States is going to start looking at the question of U.S. relations with Egypt, as well as uh, I'd like to yield now to, to my colleague Hisham about how Egyptians are he hearing what's going on in the United States and how we can have a positive impact. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so happy to hear that we're talking about free trade agreement with Egypt again. We've been uh, talking about it. I've been talking about it when I had hair. <laughs> I used to do And uh, <laughs> I really am absolutely happy that we are talking about it. Do we want an FTA US-Egypt? And this is sort of not a, a role we. Um, there, there are several parts uh, whom we are talking about. And uh, I think we're talking about US government. We're talking US companies. We're talking Egyptian companies. And we're talking Egyptian government. Um, everything I had here has been said. But <laughs> let me, uh, let me uh, look at it in a different way. I'm going to try to be a bit more uh, argumentative, uh, just for livening up the place. Um, I think for U.S. companies, it's obvious. It's, uh, it's a win-win. Uh, as Meredith is saying, the uh, Europeans are eating our lunch in Egypt uh, and expanding in other uh, places in the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Uh, and we have to do something about it. And, and FTA is, a, is one, uh, but it's a very good uh, avenue to, to pursue uh, that the U.S. companies uh, very shortly will be uh, locked out of uh, Egypt and other, and other places. For Egyptian companies that are working with the United States uh, or with U.S. companies, it's a must. Uh, they're being shut out as well with their European uh, counterparts uh, and so on. Um, who wouldn't want an FTA with the largest economy in the world? Uh, it, it is a given, and I think uh, anybody who thinks about it or, or talks about it or is, is, uh, knows about trade issues, it's something that is, is needed. I think Congressman English put his uh, finger or <coughs> what he said about a catalyst for reform. I think this is one of the most important parts of what an FTA, um, not just an FTA that is com concluded, but a, an FTA that's negotiated, as Thelma was saying. Um, this will cement a lot of the reforms that we as business people, or those who represent business people, want to make sure uh, are cemented into law in Egypt. Um, and this is the, the time to, to really uh, with the new constitution, with the new parliament, uh, with new government. This is the time to put the seed of what we really want Egypt to look like uh, in, on the economic side, in the free market side, and so on. The revolution had a lot of extremely good effects, but it also had uh, parts that included people thinking of more populism, more socialism, more uh, uh, equal equality and so on, and we need to uh, be aware of that. An FTA with the United States will give us send a signal to the whole world, uh, particularly to the U.S. companies uh, who are not in Egypt, the, the not the Coca Colas or the or the big companies, but the small and medium United States companies. It will give them uh, a signal that Egypt is part of the. Uh, global economy, it's, uh, there's a r rule of law, uh, and I think an FTA will do that. Investment rating for Egypt will definitely go up with an FTA uh, with the United States. And Egypt needs the FDI, needs uh, all, the, all the help it can get. A com increased competition for quality goods, and I think uh, Congressman Dreyer men mentioned that. Um, it opens up a huge market the United States market to Egyptian exports. And that is not an impediment to anybody or argument, anybody in Congress or labor unions or anything. If the whole products GDP of Egypt is exported to the United States, it's not going to affect the United States one little bit. And if we're talking about the most sensitive part, it's the textiles that's already done through the QIZ, so there is no more uh, products that really uh, can have a big uh, impact, uh, negative. And, and if the U.S. 
can have a free trade agreement with Mexico, Canada, and Korea, I mean, I don't think you should be worried about Egyptian exports. So the pros for Egypt um, to have an FTA are, you know, are never ending and, and they're just not debatable. Uh, FTA with the United States uh, for Egypt is, is something that is um, positive and so on. But how anxious is Egypt to have an FTA agreement with the United States? Um, Congressman Dreyer said everybody he spoke to, uh, you know, welcomed it. Of course, they welcomed it. How anxious are they to sit down and go through the negotiations? Egypt had a long laundry list of reforms uh, that were presented by the U.S. government um, many years ago before the United States entertained um, talking about a free trade agreement. And uh, we're very grateful as private sector that actually the Egyptian government did go through those reforms, uh, as Congressman English said, the banking sector, the uh, trade, uh, non-tariff barriers, and so on, uh, and tariffs went down. Um, and, and that was something that we, we were so close to signing, to starting the negotiations. Um, so we were, you know, and then politics really got in the way. Um, and we don't want that to happen again. Uh, you know, uh, if we want to put politics out of the way to look at it commercially um, for Egypt and the United States. Of course, for the United States, it's such a strategic area or, or country on the politics side, on the security side, um, on the DOD side. Uh, I think it's, it's something that uh, also is, is a given. But what has e Egypt done uh, since these uh, negotiations were stopped or not started in maybe five, six years ago? Um, the EU partnership expanded tremendously, as Meredith uh, has said in, in, in so on. The Pan-Arab Pan Free Trade Agreement is now working better, and, and, and it's the COMESA, the East Africa uh, Free Trade Agreement with Egypt. Turkey in 2007, free trade agreement with Egypt. EFTA, Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, uh, and Liechtenstein. Uh, Mercosur, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, free trade agreement uh, with Egypt. Russia, India, they're talking about it now. And now the big boy, China. The Chinese are coming. <laughs> and the Chinese are coming quickly, quietly, and strongly. Um, the Chinese uh, are, are working so hard. They have the money uh, and they have the, the expertise. N negotiating an FTA with Egypt will be very painful for the Egyptian bureaucracy. And I don't know if they have the capacity. Um, the Egyptian bureaucracy looks at what has to be done with the US FTA with trepidation. <laughs> it is huge. There's a lot of negotiations, a lot of uh, technical expertise is needed. There's a lot of legal expertise that's needed. Um, and in their mind, there's less problematic alter al alternatives, uh, again, China. China doesn't have any conditions uh, on labor. They don't have any conditions on the environment. They don't have any conditions on human rights. It's easier. But let me also look at something. Um, I, I, again, to go back, free trade agreement with the United States is, is a given. It's something that is good for Egypt. Uh, and we think it's good for the United States uh, on, on a broader, a broader sense. But let's look at Egypt's economy now, today. It's hurting, ladies and gentlemen. Meredith just said it: the first quarter of this year, minus four percent GDP. Second quarter, 
0.4. Maybe we'll end the year at 1. And this is, as Meredith said, something that was uh, 5.6 during the financial crisis, 7 and 8 before that. Um, and, and so it's a big, big drop. Um, you look at the macros, and, and, and it's still depressing. The reserves are down from $36 billion to 20. And we're losing them at about 1.5 or 2 a month, depending. Our budget deficit is 9.6 and growing. Interest rates up. Inflation up. Unemployment, as Congressman Dreyer said, 2 million have been lost. Up. The pound is down. Egypt needs short-term support. It's good to talk about the free trade agreement. It's really important to talk about the free trade ag agreement. It's even more important to have a free trade agreement. But Egypt really needs support today. Uh, and the U.S. needs to put its weight behind this. The U.S. doesn't have to fork out uh, huge sums of money uh, itself. But the United States has the weight around the world to make sure that people, other countries, support Egypt. It is important. The economy is tanking. Whatever government we have, they're going to have to deal with a very, very serious situation. The U.S. has to support Egypt. We don't need a war to kickstart U.S. support, do we? <laughs> the future of Egypt will be good. It must be good. You know, if you take everybody out of Egypt, just look at the location, it's fantastic. I mean, if you wanted to choose a location for a country, you know, you probably, you know, I know everybody's going to say, well, the United States, but no, I mean, apart from the United States. Put it anywhere in the world, you know, on the Mediterranean, on the Red Sea, with the Suez Canal, with the Nile, in Asia, in Africa, Mediterranean, Islamic, Coptic, African, it's just, it's the genius of, of, uh, of Egypt. And of course, um, the, the fantastic uh, potential uh, that is there uh, with the 80 million uh, people, half of them youth. Um, and FTA is crucial for Egypt. U.S. support now, now, is critical for Egypt. Um, and I think the youth that have startled the world um, for a quest for a better Egypt, for a better life, please, let's not let them down. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, our time is romping on pretty fast, so why don't we just jump right into questions here, and uh, if someone has one they'd like to ask, uh, the microphone will be given to you, and please state your name and affiliation. Any questions there? We've got right over here. Hi, I'm Michael Jubin. I work in the Middle East program here at CSIS. Thanks to all of you for your insights. This is a question for Mr. Fahmy in particular. Um, you mentioned the bureaucratic needs in Egypt and some, some challenges there to, in the short term, to building the capacity for a long-term uh, solution to this. What are the things that um, the bilateral relationship can be focusing on in the short term to work on those sorts of challenges in support of something like an FTA or other initiatives that require uh, that kind of sort of permanent capacity? Sure. Um, regarding the, the bureaucratic needs, what are the things that the United States and, the Egypt, and Egypt can be doing together to fill those gaps, to solve the challenges of, of technical expertise? Um, you know, are, there, are there training initiatives that can be done, that kind of thing, in, in support of a, a longer term FTA? Um, well, obviously, there's a, a, a huge learning process for uh, for an FTA. 
uh, and the learning p process doesn't just include government, but it includes the private sector. I mean, the private sector in Egypt needs to know what it means to have an FTA with the United States. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? I mean, n not everybody wins with an FTA. Uh, there are losers and winners, but the t total is, 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 is a win. Um, the technical expertise will have to come from the United States, but also it will have to come from, from Egypt. I think the private sector has uh, a lot of uh, experts uh, that the Egyptian government will need to reach out to uh, to help it uh, negotiate an, an FTA uh, or other countries that have negotiated an FTA. And I think I would, if I was the Egyptian government, I would go and find somebody from Mexico or Korea who's ne negotiated with the United States and uh, let them help uh, in the process and uh, have a learning process there. Thank you. Another question? Trying to get, there, we've got a clump over here. Why don't we do the fellow in the turtleneck? You again. Quick question. Hisham, I remember when you and you had hair. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was Secretary General for the Egypt-US President Council. At that time, we were pushing for uh, trade, not instead of aid. Uh, my question, considering the complications of having an FTE, why don't we focus on revising the investment uh, treatment? Wouldn't this be a more practical thing to work on right now and get the, the train moving and then, at a later time, we'll talk about FTE. I, I think he did ask you. I mean, I can answer, but... <laughs> yeah. um, it, you were still always asking questions when I had hair. Uh, I think the, the investment uh, opportunities in Egypt, uh, as Congressman Dreyer said, when with examples like Coca-Cola and Procter and & Gamble and General Motors and Apache and so on, there's no real impediment for, for investments uh, in Egypt. And um, I know Meredith has, has put in the uh, updating of the bilateral investment treaty. Uh, I'm not sh so sure that's uh, an that's extreme priority. I think it's something that is, is important for the United States. Um, I think if the Egyptian government is looking at it, they're going to say, well, why am I giving all these guarantees without getting something in return? Uh, and, and that's what, where the BIT and the FTA negotiations sort of uh, uh, mesh together. Um, I think there are a lot of modules in the FTA negotiations that can be done uh, either consecutively or, or, or uh, parallel-wise that can improve uh, the investment and the reforms and, uh, and so on uh, without going through a, a double negotiations like the bilateral and the, uh, and the FTA. I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm, a, I'm more positive about it uh, because I think it's a good signal. I mean, if the U.S., for us, uh, if the U.S. was able to get our domestic political consensus in a, in a spot where we could announce we would like to update the FTA with I mean, up, up, update the bit with Egypt. Um, that would be good, and I think it would be good news for people, investors looking at Egypt to as a signal of, of, of goodwill and wanting to make sure that investment was safe. Uh, bits have a lot of um, just kind of institutional benefits to them, due process requirements and so forth. Um, I get the point that maybe it's 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 more one way, but. Um, I'm sure the Egyptians can come up with something on their side that could, could go along as a companion negotiation with, with a bit. Um, and, and as a practical matter, they're a stepping stone to an FTA because every, every FTA has an investment chapter, which looks very much like a bit. So if you want to start what we've been talking here today as, as the process of, of the, the, the beneficial process of getting to a free trade agreement ultimately, a bit, it really is a stepping stone there, um, and there's others that we could talk about, and hopefully we'll have some programs in the future where we can talk about, you know, maybe it's a customs facilitation agreement or in, just interim steps of goodwill and good news for Egypt that help the bureaucracy get organized and have some good goals of transparency um, and just openness uh, that, that we think is beneficial. I mean, the Egyptians will have their views on these things, but these are goals that would be important for the United States, which we believe would help Egypt. There's another gentleman over there, yes? I am Chuck Dietrich. 
I'm Chuck Dietrich with the National Foreign Trade Council and the U.S. Middle East Free Trade Coalition. Uh, first of all, Hisham, I think your hair is great. Uh, <laughs> but you, you've been here. Hisham, I think you've been here um, so many times over the years, and you're really well known on the Hill. Um, Phil, you targeted um, the House Ways and Means focus probably more than any other time on commercial opportunities in the Middle East and how to use the commercial agenda to, um, to build our strategic agenda. What do you think is the, the mood in House Ways and Means specifically and in the Speaker's office and what steps do you think can be done to get them in a better place if they're not there already? To, to think seriously about an Egypt FTA? Um, I think that uh, they are interested, uh, they are there, I, I, full disclosure, I've not had an extended conversation with them, uh, but as you know, I know the, uh, uh, the Trade Council very well in Mr. Boehner's shop, uh, he used to be my LD. Um, they, uh, I think, are looking for next steps on the trade front. And uh, the administration, I think it's fair to say, has other preoccupations at the moment, uh, with the exception of uh, TPP and uh, Russia's uh, uh, entry into the WTO and what we would do to accommodate that. Um, there really, uh, does, it, to be fair, does not appear to be a lot immediately on the agenda. I think there is a pent-up demand uh, among House Republicans to move forward uh, on some ambitious agreements uh, that maybe go beyond traditional uh, uh, trade promotion authority and go uh, beyond uh, traditional FTAs. Uh, I think that uh, uh, particularly uh, Egypt would be challenging. Uh, there will be a natural constituency for it in the House. Uh, you'll remember Chair, I'm sorry, was co-chairing uh, with me a Middle East Economic Opportunity Caucus. Uh, I think there is, there is still the center of gravity between Ryan, uh, Mr. Brady, uh, and a few others uh, to back something that would move quickly and be very, very aggressive. Uh, but I do think it's going to take a role and a sign-off by the executive branch uh, to move something forward. Answer your question, they're hungry, and I think this would, uh, would uh, directly address what they're craving for. Phil, can I just actually follow up on that? Absolutely. When we had the last free trade agreements go through, uh, I think a lot of people were surprised that they moved through. What was the, the key selling point? I'm not sure it was a selling point as much as it was, uh, as much as it was a sea change uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, understand, historically, the Senate has been comparatively bipartisan in its support for trade agreements. Uh, however, in the House over time, uh, there had been building resistance to doing additional FTAs, uh, and I think this was as much uh, political and tactical uh, as, it, as it was anything else. Uh, what you had was fewer and fewer House Democrats who were in the space that Mr. Meeks now uh, occupies of being uh, someone willing to uh, uh, embrace uh, a new a trade initiative. Um, I, I realize some of my uh, former colleagues on Ways and Means on the Democratic side would probably disagree with me on this. Certainly there's some like Joe Crowley uh, who I think are very aggressive on trade. I just think it has gotten over time more and more difficult uh, for uh, House Democrats to find a space where they are comfortable and where they can work with their coalition uh, with, with uh, the AFL-CIO. Being put into the minority and uh, having a Republican majority with uh, very, very few AFL-CIO allies in it, uh, I think simply cleared the boards uh, to move everything forward. I mean, it, it, it's, it's really as simple as that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, question? Yes, back there. The lady in red. My name is Jillian Maroney. I'm with Nathan Associates. We have a contract with USAID, and I'm the deputy chief of party for trade facilitation in Egypt. 
And I was in Egypt uh, in the 2000s uh, when there was a lot of talk about a free trade agreement that uh, Hisham has uh, alluded to. And it was dropped for political reasons. So this is a question to the Americans. I mean, if I was the Egyptians, I would be very concerned. I mean, maybe I have an election and for president or my constitution, and it doesn't go quite the way the Americans would like. Well, how would that affect the free trade agreement negotiations? My own view is uh, I don't think it particularly would. I think this is a time when both countries have an enormous interest in moving forward for a variety of reasons. From the Egyptian standpoint, not only would a free trade agreement with the largest economy in the world give them a shot in the arm when whoever is in the new government, they're going to need to show results and increase economic growth comparatively fast. Uh, but also, I think it has a salutary effect uh, on their trade relationship with the EU. Uh, I've found over the years as a co-chairman of the EU caucus uh, that the EU uh, responds very um, aggressively uh, when the U.S. Uh, goes and poaches on uh, markets that they regard as in their backyard. We saw that with the Moroccan FTA. Um, I think that the best thing that an Egyptian government could do would be to embrace uh, against perhaps the expectation a free trade negotiation with the U.S. Uh, that would dramatically, I think, strengthen their hand in negotiating uh, a better agreement and new opportunities with the EU. There's another question over here, right? Yep. My name is Omar Mohanna. I'm an Egyptian industrialist. I'm in the cement business and car tire manufacturing business. And I'm the past president of the American Chamber of Commerce. I've been coming to Washington uh, for the last years. Uh, many, many years, uh, we've talked about free trade, and I think everything about the free trade has been said today. Uh, Hisham portrayed very well the challenges that Egypt is facing. Uh, we used to have a very good economic story and a lousy political story. I think now it's the reverse. We have a, a better uh, uh, political story and a lousy economic uh, story. But one of the big challenges that Egypt is facing now uh, is the uh, brain flight. Uh, the outcome of the, or the political outcome of the reforms that are taking place, the elections and all that uh, would lead and is, it is already uh, leading to the fact that many of the brightest and the best educated uh, are thinking twice. I mean, we have succeeded over the years in attracting the best and the brightest back to Egypt. Now we see uh, a reverse. We see uh, a real brain flight that is starting to take place. And I think that maybe uh, an FTA uh, could reinforce a bit the sense of confidence and would give uh, uh, the young and the brightest the, uh, another opportunity uh, to, to, re to rethink their plans uh, and try to live with the uh, political uh, actualities of, of, of Egypt uh, and have uh, possibly uh, a more uh, optimistic uh, approach. So maybe this is an additional uh, point that could be added to an FTA. Uh, thank you. Uh, any more questions? There we go. We got one right back there. Andrew Rothgaber. I actually used to work for Gaffey, the investment promotion agency uh, based in Cairo. And somewhat related to the last question, I was curious to hear, given the investment climate in Egypt now, what the government, whether it's Gaffey or another ministry, is doing to address investor confidence, whether that's current investors or future investors. That's mainly directed to you, uh, Mr. Sham. Thanks. You have, to, you have to feel sorry for them. I mean, uh, uh, you know, every time you try to uh, attract uh, investment, there is something in Tahrir Square that people, you know, think that's all over Egypt. Um, and, and investors are, are, are not, you know, uh, very risky. On the other hand, there have been uh, very, very good examples of uh, companies coming in, uh, and and there are deals in Egypt now that are companies have invested, uh, whether from the Gulf or from uh, Sweden, um, and they've made substantial investments since January uh, in Egypt. 
And I think those are those, those companies are going to make a uh, big bucks in Egypt. Uh, they they're betting on Egypt, uh, not just geography but market and uh, and uh, and the reforms that are coming. You know, if everything goes well, you know, you, you and and you have all the physical ingredients of Egypt uh, right, and then you add to it the democracy, rule of law, uh, less corruption, and so on more human rights and, and so on, you know, there's n never going to be a better place uh, around the world. We have time for one last question. Right there. Uh, hi, my name is Robbins Pancake, formerly with uh, Hewlett Packard and Agilent Te Technologies. My question is mainly for uh, Hisham, I think, and that is uh, the concern I hear expressed around Washington, uh, particularly in the business community, is who do we negotiate, I mean, from, from public policy people? Who do we negotiate with? Uh, there's an election every three months or so, a new parliament, new president, whatever. So uh, it boils down to, is there, uh, is there a trade minister? Is there an institutional structure? Is there uh, enough enthusiasm in Egypt so that no matter what happens politically, that there will be the, the, uh, the foundation for proceeding with discussions? Um, because I think the, the image certainly here is that, um, boy, we just need to wait, you know, nine to 12 months before we even start uh, the conversation. Um, I, I think what Congressman Dreyer uh, said before is that uh, everybody, um, all the structures there and the political parties uh, realize that investment and attracting investment and making it a business friendlier environment is important. Um, yes, there are challenges now of getting people to sign off on, 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 on difficult uh, deals and, uh, and so on, or things that require uh, special uh, licenses and so on. That is a challenge right now. But if you're, if you're an investment or you're thinking about Egypt and so on, this is the time to do your due diligence. Look around, look at the, uh, look at the market, uh, look at the segmentation. Look at the uh, who's going to be your partner. Um, I think if you do all that, it's it's going to take you some time anyway. Uh, and once uh, the, you know, we're we're talking now June uh, for having a a president. You know, constitution, parliament uh, by by end of June and July. Okay, even if that's extended for a couple of months. So you're you're talking seven months, and I think any serious investment will take longer than that to, to put together. Uh, so you use this time to, to do your um, investigations, to do your, uh, you know, what you need to, to have an investment going. Look at the financing, look at the, all that. And there is a lot of support, uh, in, especially in financing. I mean, everybody, the EBRD, the OPIC, uh, the EXIM, uh, all these institutions are, are putting their uh, weight behind uh, com U.S. companies uh, working in Egypt. So this is the time to, to look at the, especially in the financing packages and so on. Well, thank you very much. We're wrapping up our session now, and thank you to the panel. It was really terrific. I think everybody learned a lot. Thank you, the guests, for coming over to CSIS. I think we heard both that there's a, there's a good um, economic reason for a free trade agreement. There's a good political reason. I'm very struck by Congressman Dreyer quoting uh, Se Assistant Secretary Jeff Feltman saying, this is the kind of issue that can bring all Egyptians together. And I think that's something at this time is really a, 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 a vital interest. So let's um, uh, hope that the, the CIS report here can really reinvigorate the debate and, and move this forward and get, start to get something moving on this because uh, it sounds like the time is here. Thank you very much for coming. Bye -bye.